Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, let's start our, our fourth uh, lecture in our event. But before, uh, I will show you some announcement from our sponsors. Good morning. My name is Paolo Gamba, and I am the president for the year 2020 of the Geoscience Remotsensi Society. Okay, so first of all, what is a scientific society? What is GRSS? So a scientific society is a group of scientists, researchers and practitioners with common interests and common framework for building a community. In our specific case, we are uh, people who are dealing with theory, concept and techniques of science and engineering as they apply to remote sensing of the earth, ocean, atmosphere and space as well as the processing, interpretation, and dissemination of this information. So what are the activities of the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society? Well, we have a number of publications, we support conferences, we have professional activities, we have a number of information service and technical activities and education activities as well. We are a global community, which means that we are arranged around large number of uh, groups of people that we call chapters all around the world. We have currently more than 90 uh, chapters all around the world. As a result, GRSS disseminates premium science by means of its three main journals, which are the Transactional Geoscience Remote Sensing, the Geoscience Remote Sensing Letters, the IEEE Journal of Selected Topics in Applied Earth Observation and Remote Sensing, but we have also a magazine, which, by the way, has a very, very important uh, uh, role. We also provide opportunities to, for the different communities, like, for instance, the community working on image analysis and data fusion. We have also, uh, we also sponsor community-driven events, like uh, the very um, successful Earth Vision Workshop, but also the SpaceNet Challenge Data Challenges here, which is organized by SpaceNet. We support also community developed tools like the DESE website, which is data and algorithm standard evaluation website, and also activities related to RFI observations. So we also facilitate and connect. We have a number of activities at the, in, a, in our main conference. We have the so-called Thai events, but we also organize different events related to uh, connection with uh, companies, industries. We have a number of activities like for young professionals, for women in uh, engineering and in geoscience and remote sensing. And we share our knowledge on hot topics by means of distinguished lectures, lecturers and industry speakers. We have also a number of uh, uh, educational activities. This is one of them. This is basically, let's say, one of the many uh, different small uh, educational videos for uh, kids that we have in different languages. But we have also, in addition to that, a number of webinars, which are also for people who are not kids, about uh, remote sensing in different languages as well. Uh, we offer continuing education by means of webinars, which is especially uh, important and useful in this situation where we are not able anymore to move around the world as we were in the past. So we can support continuing education of students and young professionals through conferences, journals, our magazine, webinars and so on. We can promote capabilities of the different communities, algorithms, data set, by means of the data fusion context, by means of dedicated events at our conferences, by means of the industrial distinguished lecture or industrial speakers. We help connect companies and young motivated people by means of the young professional event, by means of student grants, by means of the Thai forum. And we make the different community of Earth observation practitioner and researcher be aware of their and your topics of interest. So GRSS is actually a community of communities where we could together share and promote ideas, systems and data set. We can meet with other communities and gain from their perspective and we can build 
different collaboration, to learn more from each other and to come together in conferences. Thank you very much and I hope you will enjoy this uh, summer school and all the interesting topic and talks that you are going to listen during these days. Thank you, Paolo. Hi, everyone. My name is Cheryl Rose Reyes, and I currently serve as the president of the International Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing Student Consortium. I am very happy to welcome you all to the sixth edition of the IEEE GRSS Young Professionals and ISBRS Student Consortium Summer School this year. To start this event, I would like to present a bit about the ISBRS Student Consortium. We are the official representation of the youth to ISBRS. We link students, young researchers, and professionals worldwide interested in photogrammetry, remote sensing, and spatial information science to promote their scientific and professional developments. We advocate imaging and geospatial science for informed, scientifically valid, and technologically sound observations of Earth conditions and trends that lead to improved and effective decision making. The consortium is also accepting registrations for individual membership. Please scan the QR code in this slide if you are interested to join us. I work together with members of the board of directors from all across the globe. Charles from Uganda is our vice president. Charmaine, who is currently in Ireland, is in charge of our newsletter. Mustafa, our social media administrator, is from Turkey. And finally, Sona from Azerbaijan is our web administrator. One of the major events that we host and coordinate every year are the summer schools. In 2019, the summer schools were in Uganda, Poland, South Korea and Brazil. These summer schools provide international learning opportunities for students and young professionals at a minimum cost. This year, we scheduled three summer schools, but due to the COVID-19 situation, two of them were postponed and we are sincerely thankful to the organizers of this summer school for making this an incredible virtual event. This is the first ISPRS Student Consortium Summer School that will be hosted online. And as you can see, we have an amazing lineup of speakers who will deliver lectures on remote sensing and machine learning. The consortium currently hosts the virtual rooms of the webinar series to provide our community with more opportunities to learn and interact with experts in our scientific community. The webinar series was conceptualized in 2018, and we have organized webinars on Google Earth Engine, computer vision, and machine learning. The Virtual Rooms is an initiative to keep the members of the consortium connected during this challenging time and to help them navigate our changing lifestyles. All the resources for the webinar series and the virtual rooms are available on our website and our YouTube channel. We also publish an official newsletter called Spectrum, which covers the broad applications of remote sensing, photogrammetry, and spatial information science, and welcomes contributors from diverse backgrounds and disciplines. We publish four issues a year, and our most recent issue is related to the current pandemic and the significance of geospatial information in tackling the impacts of this global health crisis to our society. The ISPRS Congress is one of the biggest gatherings in our scientific community, which is held every four years. The Congress hosted a virtual event for all papers submitted this year and postponed the in-person meeting for 2021. During the Congress, the consortium will be hosting a three-day youth forum, which will feature the following activities. Speed dating, technical sessions, a special session on women in remote sensing, photogrammetry, and spatial information science, a panel discussion, the general assembly for our members, a student night, another summer school, and we'll co-organize a mapping party. The consortium would also like to invite you to nominate papers for the Excellence Award to be given during this event. Please scan the QR code for eligibility and nominations. Also, please visit the ISPRS Congress official website for updates. Finally, I would like to invite you all to join our communities on Facebook, 
Twitter, and to visit our website for all the information shared in this presentation. And again, I would like to invite you all to register as an individual member by scanning the QR code on the right. This is the end of my presentation, and I wish you all a meaningful summer school. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cher. Uh, so I would like to invite Professor João Paulo Papa from uh, São Paulo State University. Thank you, João, for accepting this invitation. So thank you, Jefferson. It's my, my pleasure to be here. Uh, and also, um, I'm glad to be the chair here and to introduce you our speaker for today. And also, I'd like to wish you good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on the place you are in, in the globe, right? Um, I think this kind of initiative is, is very important for, for everyone and mainly for the young professionals. So uh, I'm glad to present our speaker for, for today, Professor Jan Wegner. Um, he got his PhD at Leibniz um, University at Hanover, 2011, and he joined um, ETH Zurich in 2012. And, uh, and he also currently is the head of the EcoVision Lab, uh, and he does research on, on, on machine learning and remote sensing, and mainly to solve ecological questions. And also, uh, Professor Yan is the founder and chair of the ISPR S. Um, group on large scale machine learning for uh, geospatial data analysis. And also, he's the organizer and, and the chair of the CVPR Earth Vision uh, workshops. So, I'm, I'd like to, to go forward with the, the presentation. And yeah, it's, it's your time now. Thank you so much for, for being here and accepted the invitation. Yes, so thank you so much, Joao, and also thanks a lot to Jefferson for inviting me and having me in this virtual summer school, which is a fantastic idea, I think, because it allows a lot of uh, colleagues and young enthusiastic scientists and professionals to learn about new trends. And um, I choose the topic of my talk to be in machine learning for geospatial data, so rather broad, which is an umbrella term for just presenting in the next, let's say, 50 minutes or so, um, a, a bunch of projects that we are currently working on and that I think are worth sharing with you. All right. So I, sh I um, divided my talk into three parts according to the input data we use. So the first part will be um, about uh, processing of ground and interpretation of ground level images. And uh, the second part will be on 3D point clouds and, and depth images. And then last but not least, I will present our ongoing initiatives and in research and remote sensing. So let's start with the very first project. And always on the slides, when I start to talk about one of the projects, I put um, the publication. So if you want to read more details about the projects, just look at those publications. Um, later on, there's also some unpublished material, so to just give you a sneak peek into what will be published uh, some month into the future. So our first project that has been ongoing for quite a while with colleagues from UBS One in France and Caltech colleagues in, uh, in Pasadena is um, this urban object mapping project where our primary goal was and is today to invis investigate the impact of climate change and human activities on the trees in cities. And um, when I started this project, we asked, okay, how are people are doing this today? And it turned out that mostly there's um, arborists, so experts in, in trees, going out into the streets, um, basically measuring the GPS position of each tree and then assessing more properties like the stress level of the tree, um, defoliation, the tree species, and so on. And um, it becomes obvious very quickly that um, this strategy does not scale well, which in turn leads to a situation that, for example, in, in California, the 
um, three tree inventories are more than 30 years old and completely outdated. So we were looking for a nice and automated and, and cheap way to come up with new tree inventories and to track them over time. And what our idea was is basically using um, Google Street View panorama images. And we are using these uh, Google panoramas here for our project, but basically it would work with any kind of mobile mapping system data. It just needs to be um, captured from the street level. And moreover, um, because we in, in my team here, we do very technical research, we thought um, it would be very interesting to um, process multiple views onto the same object in this at the same time. So, and this is what is shown on this image here. Is, so what we usually have in this mobile mapping system, same in Google Street View, is that we see the same tree in this case from multiple different viewpoints. It's visible in multiple different images. And we wanted to use this knowledge not only to detect the tree better, but also to use the geometry that comes with the images when you download them. So a rough GPS position and a rough heading to constrain the position of the tree better. So the goal is really detect the tree and assign a geographic position to the tree such that you can come up with a map. And our idea here was then that we try to jointly learn the multi-view uh, geometry. So here the two views, but we have up to four or five views in our approach. This multi-view geometry together with the warping between views of the same object instances for robust cross-view object detection. So the idea really is, um, if we see the same tree from a different perspective, um, this also um, can be learned together with the geometry because the change of perspective on the object depends on the change of the geometry, right? Of the change of the relative pose of the camera. So learning this as a joint distribution, the pose, the relative um, pose, together with the warping of the object, uh, seemed a good idea to us. And um, an overall idea was when you look at this, so uh, this is a visualization in Google, from Google Maps with a 3D view. And you put in the tree T here, another tree T, and then many, many more. And those are the cameras here, C1 and C2. And you have a certain distance between them that you can roughly compute given the GPS data that comes with the um, panoramas. And you have a heading and so on. Um, then, and you look at this figure, you quickly see this can be turned um, and viewed as, as a graph. And if you add then more trees and more cameras, it becomes even more obvious that we are dealing with a graph problem here. And since we are in the era of deep nets, um, we thought it would be great to try something out with um, a graph neural networks. And I will now quickly talk you through this pipeline that we came up with and three different steps. This is the overview. And as I said, the full um, algorithm is then um, provided in, in this paper in the, in the EC, ECCV to, to 2020 paper. So the first is that we have um, this input images. So um, four panoramas here, for example. Then we compute the basic CNN features with the backbone, the feature proposal network layer. And then we fuse those features so this is all part of this object detector step where we have to detect all trees in all um, images. And now next comes the part where we have to basically you find the correspondences between detections of the same tree um, across uh, different views on the same tree. And um, it looks a bit like this. So what we do is that we have a bounding box um, prediction then and um, we classify the, the bounding boxes and um, we set up this graph and this is a graph example how it could look like so it's a fully connected graph between the cameras and the trees and among the cameras and camera to tree and tree to all the cameras and what we then basically do is we do graph convolution convolutions and at the end we have an edge pooling so what we do is we basically have a fully connected graph and then we try to get rid of those edges that do not, uh, that are not true. So basically an edge between a camera and a tree, although that particular tree cannot be seen by that camera. And then we get 
quite uh, many loss functions that all make up the final loss. So we have the classification loss to, to detect the tree. We have the bounding box regression, which fits the bounding box size to the tree. We have the, the, the graph loss here to basically uh, get rid of those edges here, also that are meaningless connections. And we have a geolocalization loss, which basically then fine tunes the position of um, the tree in geographic coordinates, given all the different views on the same tree. Yes, and if we do this uh, joint approach where we learn um, the, the relative pose um, together with the um, detection of the trees, we can do a lot of cool stuff. So this is an example um, uh, in Pasadena where we see exactly the same tree but uh, from um, uh, with a 90 degree difference in angle. So the street view car basically uh, drove around the corner here and now sees the tree from a completely different side. So if you would want to match those two images of the same tree based only on visual appearance, it's basically impossible. But if we have the um, rough um, relative pose that we have jointly learned together with this warping, so with the perspective change, you can uh, detect that this is exactly the same tree. Same thing also if you have uh, very uh, similarly looking trees, like here, the appearance is very similar. So this would lead to a lot of confusion if you would um, only match based on image appearance. But if you now have the relative pose that comes with it, you see that those trees are not um, positioned at the same tree. Yes, and then of course we do this for uh, thousands of trees. And we also did this for a second data set for traffic science um, in mapillary dash cam data sets. And we come up with a de detection mean average precision for the trees of um, 0 0.74 and a bit better for the mapillary traffic science. And I have to say that those trees that we miss, they are usually occluded in the images, so by trucks and so on. So you can not really see them, even though you have multiple views of them. And of course, we also have false positives, and false positives are usually objects that look like trees, like like power poles, for example, with wooden wooden trunks. And we have a geo um, positioning error here of the of the trees of a bit less than three meters in Pasadena, and mapillary terrific signs is a bit worse. And this is um, a, to a large uh, part due to the poor GPS position that comes with the original panorama images. So if you get something better, you can also improve it. All right. Then uh, we just, uh, for, for um, trying for the fun of it, uh, we also wanted to know, well, if we just have those, now the detections of the trees, um, can we also classify the tree species? And we did a very simple approach, standard. This was in 2000. We did this originally in 2016, so four years ago already. VGG16 was the best network at the time. Um, the ResNet um, was, um, got much popular, uh, popularity sh soon afterwards. And we just took a standard uh, image classification um, approach with the VGG16 network. And um, we processed um, up to um, 70 different species in Pasadena with uh, images then like this, that from the trees that were detected. And we got an average precision of 80% for the 40 most dominant species. And this is what you can see here. So this is a log scaling here. So this is the classes up to class 40. And you see that at um, the 40th most dominant class, we have a bit more than 100 images in the training data set. Yeah. And um, this is where you can still see that the, um, uh, the average class precision, of course, goes rapidly down. And here, until 40, um, you end up at uh, 80. Um, but if you go then further down, you have less images than 100. It's uh, basically impossible to train a reasonable deep neural net. Even 100 images is, is, is basically not sufficient. But still, the cool thing is, this is only based on RGB images. So there's no need for it, nothing. It's just standard Google Street View um, images and crops of those. And still, you get a very uh, decent accuracy. All right, so next topic is um, on uh, social media image analysis. And um, 
this the idea here was that if a flooding event occurs somewhere on earth then usually uh, people start tweeting about it or they put it on instagram or whatever on facebook and the idea was that we just um, download all of those images of that area and based on the images alone we give a rough estimate about the water depth and you can imagine um, for this particular case if you use a learning based strategy you, you don't have any real ground truth. I mean, it's impossible to be in all of those different places at the same time and, and also consequently. So what we did is basically we, we, we looked up what is the average size of the global human, the global adult. It turns out that's one meter 70. And then um, we looked at images um, with humans and we always look, okay, what's the water level according to the human standing in the water. So is it up to the ankles? Is it up to the knees, up to the hips, and, and so on, right? And based on this um, level definition, we then also translate that scale to other objects. So children, cars, buses, trucks, bicycles, buildings, and so on, and that we have as objects and we quantify the water level. And then we basically uh, come up with an approach that um, is based on the well-known uh, mask RCNN approach, which is an instant segmentation approach, but we have several different refinements that we add to it. So this is uh, the, an object detection loss that is part of the original loss and it's instant segmentation. So we re distinguish, distinguishes different instances of the same object class, like different uh, humans in the same image. And then we have this object class specific water level of loss, which basically looks at how much of a particular object is occluded. And then we minimize the combined loss, which basically tells us, okay, a water depth uh, per object instance. And then we have a post-processing step where we uh, have all the different uh, water levels per, ob per object instance. So this is shown here. So for example, this uh, human here sitting on the front of the car is correctly assigned water level zero because this human is not touching the water. There's nothing of the human in the water, so there's no evidence about the water level here. And those are all predictions already on the test set um, using this deep net approach. And this is what water level two for the car. And then there's again, this is water level five for this adult who, who's pulling his family in the boat. And those people in the boat and the child and this older or this woman, they are correctly assigned water levels zero because again, they are not touching the water and as such, they don't have direct evidence about the water level. Yes, and if we do this, and we then have basically, um, basically we compute the trimmed mean across all of this uh, water levels. And we do this for uh, 1,200 images and after cross validation, we get the mean absolute error of around eight centimeters, which is rather good. And so if you want to first estimate and you only of a certain water depth in the region, so just let's say, can the Red Cross drive a truck and so on, this is pretty good. All right, so next slide is uh, then on 3D and depth. So um, this is um, a point cloud. So we look at point cloud uh, matching and 3D point key point descriptors. And um, what we want to do is that we want to register two um, different point clouds that overlap with 30% or more automatically. And the idea here is that we use a so-called smooth, smooth density representation to learn descriptive key points in the point clouds that generalize across different C layouts and, and sensor modalities. So you can basically train um, yeah, on, on a um, LiDAR point cloud, but still use the model to match um, RGBD depth images and, and so, for example. And the, um, we call this really smooth net. And the cool thing about it is, is that it has a very low dimensional, highly descriptive uh, feature vectors compared to most state of the art. And it's their rotation invariant, and they are what I just mentioned already, uh, they generalize across different scenes and sensors, which is also fantastic. And I will just um, quickly talk you through how this actually works. So what we do is, is first, when the raw pointer comes in, we extract a spherical neighborhood around um, each interest point. 
then we estimate a unique local reference phase, a red frame based on a singular value decomposition of the covariance matrix, which is pretty standard. Then we transform it to its canonical representation. And then we voxelize it into a smooth density representation with the 3D Gaussian smoothing curve. And then we basically normalize the smooth densities. And then another um, trick um, on good, um, probably good engineering is that we use a so-called soft margin batch hard loss. So just to explain this, so the input are two point clouds. So those are the two point clouds here on the right side with an overlap of at least 30% as smooth, smooth dens densities. And the out output then um, after all the processing is a very compact local feature descriptor um, for those points. So what we do is that we randomly sample 300 anchor points. So those are these round points here um, of the overlapping part. And um, the next is that we also do this um, transformation with the other point cloud. Now for, this is for the training case. And we sample um, positive sample as, uh, in, as nearest neighbors in feature space. And if you look at those points, then if you cut out the cube, um, around those points, this is what it looks like here in the um, first point cloud. This is in the second point cloud that we are basically transforming to this one. And the interesting part is now this uh, loss function here, which is this soft margin batch hard loss, where we have um, the anchor points here and here. So this is what we also see here. So the round points are the anchor points. This again here, top right, are the anchor points. And then in, in this part here, we have the positive samples and we try to minimize the error in feature space between the anchor points, so this ones, and the positive samples, so this ones here. So we minimize the error between this part of the point cloud and the same place seen at, the, at this location in this one. And then um, we also, and this is this um, batch hard, the, the part then we also try to push away the negative samples as much as we can. So we take the negative samples that are hard, the hardest non-corresponding samples, which means um, that we basically want um, those points of the second point cloud that look the most similar uh, to those ones here in the first one. And we want to push them as far away as we can in feature space and then decide them. And this is what is then shown here. So those are the negative ones, those are the positive ones, and those are the anchor points. And if you do this, this is a, a rather powerful strategy. And we did this for several data sets. And this is the well-known um, 3D match indoor RGB depth data set from Princeton colleagues. And if we do this and compare it, um, the performance to the state of the art in 2019, I must say, so last year, is that ours outperformed um, state of the art by more than 20 percentage points, so which was which is great. And then even uh, if we train on 3D match, so, th so this um, RGB depth indoor data, and now we test on a data set that is uh, captured with a terrestrial lidar um, sensor and outdoors and and in the forest, so in vegetation. So there's no retraining here. Then uh, we are still very good. And this is cool because it shows that uh, the model generalizes very well, which is due mainly to the smooth density because the main uh, trick here is of the smooth den density representation of the point clouds is that before we give the point cloud um, to the learning engine, to the learner, we basically do a lot of smoothing um, on the point cloud and get rid of a lot of outliers and, and, and so on and points such that the network itself does not have to learn it. Because this is what we found usually the first thing that the deep nets for point clouds do, that they learn a smoothing, smoothing in, in the earliest layers. And now this is done prior to processing. And then all the training data that we have uh, can be used for the deep net to learn strong descriptors. And um, this is, from my point of view, the major reason why our approach outperforms all others by uh, almost um, by more than 20 percentage points and also why it generalizes. Yeah? Because um, if you smooth the LiDAR point cloud and use it for training or you smooth RGBD 
um, point cloud or depth image that doesn't matter so much. It, both of them, if we are, they are captured of the same scene, look, will, will look rather similar. All right, so second um, topic on um, depth data. This is a work on guided super resolution. And the idea is that we want to increase the resolution of a depth image. So such low resolution source image that is, pro for example, captured with a depth sen sensor and then a smartphone or a Kinect sensor. Uh, using the high resolution data captured with an RGB camera that is on the same sensor. So we want to get a much more high resolution depth image. So this one, so this is what we want to get. This is our target, given a very low resolution source of the depth plus a high resolution RGB image. And um, this is an extremely ill posed problem. And our idea is um, different from what is out there at the moment. And the idea is basically that we translate the, the guide image, so this one, to the target domain directly. So we directly learn what RGB value relates to what depth value. And then we constrain the result um, by matching it back to the source image, to, so to this downsampled image. And this is uh, again, so how it looks like. So we start basically from the RGB image and we try and we train a direct mapping with a deep net of each uh, value here in the pixel to the depth value, to the, so to the target space. And of course, this wouldn't work very well. We would get a lot of noise and so on because color alone and even a bit uh, of context does not tell you enough about the depth. So we need a very good constraint. And the constraint is basically if we um, then downsample this image, then the average um, value inside a particular patch that has the size of the original resolution of the source should match to the depth value here. So that's the constraint. So we downsample in this image and match it to the original source image during training. And we downsampled. And the cool thing is that this translation here, it operates per pixel. And also the constraint is per pixel. So we don't have any upscaling. So it does mean we have no blur in the image. We can keep sharp edges and in contrast to a state of the art. So this is um, then how we um, implement it. So to get this depth the target image, we basically um, formulate as a multi-layer perceptron. But um, we can then turn it if we introduce convolutions to a conv fully convolutional network. So CNN basically, one by one, by C filter kernels. And because we can do this, we can then use a PyTorch or TensorFlow, so very efficient parallel deep learning frameworks. And as again, as I said, so once we have this direct mapping from um, pixel to target, so from RGB image to the depth image, we still have to constrain it. So we, this is then put here. And we still have to downsample it and make sure that the average across a certain patch size matches the original um, depth image at lower resolution. So and if we do this, so here's again the input, very low resolution image, and this is the guide. So that's the depth input image. This is the guide RGB image. And um, this is the target. So this is what we want to achieve. So that's ground truth here. And if we look at ours, so this is a result that we get. And the performance is uh, measured in terms of mean squared errors. So. We have this one, and then we compare it to several yeah, state-of-the-art and baseline methods. So the, the simplest way to um, upscale and uh, get improved resolution of uh, such cores stumps, of course, like a bicubic um, interpolation just without any RGB image. So this doesn't work very well. Then there are several other baselines. But uh, in terms of numbers, they are much, much worse. And you can see that they get very blurry. So our trick of uh, mapping uh, directly RGB values to uh, the depth values, and then only afterwards constraining it to the lower resolution of the depth image uh, seems to work quite well. But what you also see is that we cannot get rid of a little bit of artifacts uh, that depend on the texture. So still a bit of texture, which doesn't tell here, this doesn't directly correlate with depth, does um, tran is transmitted to the depth image. So this is, of course, something that you would want to avoid. And it's about future work to decide on how we want to, to proceed here. 
Okay, so now moving to the last part of the talk, which is um, on, on remote sensing, which also makes up a large um, part of the research that we are doing. And the first one was that um, I have basically since my PhD times worked on semantic segmentation of aerial images of uh, synthetic Apache radar images, or optical aerial images or satellite images, and always with the motivation to basically make maps. And it really struck me and it, it bothered me that we only always do semantic segmentation and stop there. And if we want to transform this pixel map into a real map, a vectorized map, so into polygons um, that we can upload to the web, share via mobile phones or use in a GIS system, you need a lot of different post-processing steps. Um, so I don't know, some Douglas Polka algorithm to vectorize your raster outputs and so on and so on. And then this gets again a very hierarchical procedure, very interactive with a low degree of automation. And my idea at the time was why can we not take everything into the same end-to-end -end learnable deep net framework? And that's actually then what we did. So the idea is really that uh, given an input um, aerial uh, image, um, we directly want to output a vector map, so polygons that you can directly map in G use in a GIS system or upload to OpenStreetMap, for example. And we were inspired by Polygon RNN at the time, so um, the Waterson and Fiddler groups at, in Toronto. And we're leaning a bit on their ideas how to implement it. So, and, and this is then how it looks. So basically what we have is that this object detection, so buildings and, and road in our case, and we have instant segmentation and then we have vectorization, vectorization within one unified approach that relies on the CNN um, married with a recurrent neural network with convolutional long, long short term memory. So it's a basically convolutional LSTM approach. And the CNN um, takes as input an image and in order to um, transform the image to the polygon representation, what the CNN does, it basically detects the key points. So those are corners of a building and edge evidence of the building footprints in the road networks. And this is how it looks. So we have the standard CNN backbone that computes all those beautiful features. And what you um, then then have you for training. So um, you try to get here um, the edge features for the boundary, the boundary mask. So you have um, try to get the, the edge evidence here and you have a vertex, vertex mask. Um, that comes from OpenStreetMap also, where you try to detect the corner points. And then once you have all the corner points and we do the same for the road, so we expect the center axis of the road and we <coughs> get also all the vertices of, of the road, so where junctions are or where a road is leaving the image. And then one by one, we pass each vertex to the RNN, which then tries to connect all these different vertices into a unified polygon. And this is what it then looks like. So you have the image features of the CNN and they are fed sequentially to this convolutional LSTM. So you, you as at road, for example, you go through all the different vertices, which is shown here. So here's one, here one, here one, here one, here one. And you try to connect them with the RNN into a, a polygon representation, a graph in the end. Vector representation. You, we do the same for um, the buildings, and um, we start at multiple key points. And because then the question is, okay, at the at the building here, where to start? And then sometimes it might happen that the wrongly nodes are connected that go through the building and so on. So an hour basically engineering hack to deal with uh, wrong connections was that we start at multiple different key points at the same object. So this one, this one, this one, and so on, the same for roads. And we generate an over complete set of uh, building object hypotheses, the same for roads. So we basically have multiple different shapes, multiple different versions of the same building. And we then condense all this multiple different polygons uh, into one final representation using beam search. And beam search is a well established a heuristic method in, in the machine learning community.
Yes, and all, if all of this works nice, then those are the outputs. So we have this vector representation, polygon of the building, and the polygon of, of the road. And here are some results, and we did this for a very large data set that we came up. So, so for buildings, we have uh, three, we computed this for three million buildings and for almost 9,000 kilometers of roads. And um, we, um, this is a typical output that you see. So we compare it to baseline and state of the art. So if you use mask RCNN, so a very good um, method for um, the instance segmentation to pilot, you see this is the pixel wise presentation. So each pixel is annotated. And here we only have the vertices and the polygon. And since we know what kind of vertices they are, they belong to a building, we can just fill it. And this is then the only representation is directly polygon. The cool thing about the RNN is that we implicitly learn priors on um, the angles here. So that 90 degree angles are preferred in contrast to a standard semantic segmentation, deep net or some Oscar CNN, where you only have very local connections um, despite the large receptive field of uh, the CNN. And there you don't have this general prior on the sharp edges, but in the polygon representation, we have this abstract uh, prior that we um, learn implicitly. Yes, and we do the same thing for road and compare it with um, um, others. So road tracer at the time, for example. So this is the ground truth graph. The blue vertices are connected with, uh, um, yeah, with these orange edges. And road tracer, you see, has a lot, a lot of different vertices because it's an incremental sequential approach, while ours has a very lean representation. So road tracer result here is almost, if you want to use it directly in, in, in the GIS system, it's basically impossible. Um, and this is our representation. So of course we do miss uh, some edges here, but in general it's quite okay. And then if you evaluate it, it also performs quite well. All right, so moving on um, um, to now um, topics uh, where uh, there's a strong focus in my group now is on environmental problems. So the idea is to really um, investigate, do top computer vision research and machine learning research on a very technical level to solve environmental problems. And what we have here is that we basically want to map an um, oil palm plantation. So you probably know that oil palm oil palms are very controversial. On the one hand, of course, they produce a lot of um, fat that is desperately needed for any kind of production, chocolate, for example. And they use relatively little space to do so. On the other end, they also are a very valuable um, um, yeah, cash crop, so to speak, and provide a great um, economical opportunity for people, like, for example, in Malaysia and, and Indonesia. On the other hand, it's well known that this um, monocultures and plantations destroy a lot of rainforest and biodiversity. And there's a lot of illegal deforestation that is happening. So they destroy a lot of um, precious nature too. And to just such that we know and understand what's going on to map all these oil palm plantations. Um, we have to know where they are, how dense um, these oil palms are planted. And our idea is now that we want to coin, count all oil palm trees um, globally based on Sentinel-2 images. Because Sentinel-2 images uh, come for free, they come every five days, which is great in the tropics. Because even if you have clouds, then at least once a month, every two months, you get an, get an image where you can actually see something. The, the, the um, difficulty here is that, of course, one tree, so one oil palm here in the image, is much smaller than the pixel on the ground um, of a Sentinel 2 image, so which is a 10 by 10 meter pixel. And an oil palm is approximately one third of that. So the idea is then we, I mean, we cannot use um, object detectors directly. It's totally impossible. So what we do is we turn tree mapping into a density estimation task. And this is uh, what we then do. So we, we basically uh, combine the, this identification of the tree species. So detecting or semantic segmentation of uh, palm oil trees. And we also do it for coconut and counting them. So really understanding how many, um, oil palms or coconut trees are below one single Sentinel-2 pixel 
Um, we do this and we, we formulate this as a simultaneous, a simultaneous task. So because this evidence from the um, a semantic segmentation and the counting task are mutually reinforcing. So we have the semantic segmentation with a, a specific loss function and together with the density estimation task, which is a regression loss function. And we combine both to have both. So we have in the end, uh, we know uh, where palm oil or coconut is growing and we know how many trees uh, are under each pixel. And this is just a, and then a result, for example. So this is a ground truth. We came up with ground truth based on Google Maps aerial images where we really manually were sitting down, labeling a few images, and then we were training an object detector on those high resolution images to get more and more ground truth. And then this is a prediction once we train our model for density estimation. You can see that, of course, it looks a lot smoother because the resolution is just much worse in the center two image. But still, um, it, the sun, um, it gets the areas quite well. And we will also see that it counts very well. So we did this for coconut and palm, so oil palm and olive trees, olive trees in Spain, and coconut and palm in Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. And our data set is we had um, almost 90,000 coconut trees and um, more than 140,000 oil palm trees. And we could count those trees um, with a difference of uh, 4%. So we got very close. And um, we did this for a test region um, bigger than 200, um, 200 square kilometers. And at the moment, we are scaling this up. And this is a first sneak peek to some new um, results that will come out and, and will go to, will be submitted for review soon. Is that we want to do this palm oil density maps now for whole Southeast Asia, and then also compare and track over time, how did this change over the years? Okay, so now I'm slowly coming to my uh, last part of the presentation, which is a, a bigger project where we want to estimate uh, canopy height and biomass at global scale. So at the moment, if we want to estimate canopy height, um, what is done usually is that we have very expensive airborne campaigns, or we have space-borne campaigns like ISAT and ISAT-2, and, but very often for biomass, what we have is in situ surveys. So our colleagues from the environmental sciences, biologists go out into the forests and estimate the biomass. And this doesn't scale. If you want uh, to estimate a biomass map or canopy height map at global scale, which are very important uh, for climate uh, modeling and the modeling of climate change and also um, estimating biodiversity at global scale, these are super important input variables, um, then you cannot uh, do this based on in situ data alone. And our idea is now here to um, basically do this based on optical satellite data. So we want to develop an accurate, scalable approach use, using central two satellite images to estimate canopy height. <clears throat> and the basic uh, component here is that we basically separate the spectral information um, about the canopy height from the spatial context, so texture in the images. And we use this Cholet at R, um, CVPR 217 approach where we have separate, separable convolutions. <clears throat> Another thing is, um, as since we are moving away from computer vision images and terrestrial images and have rather low resolution images, one thing is that a lot of the standard computer vision architectures cannot directly be applied to our sort of medium or high resolution imagery. So we have to get rid of all the, the down, down and up sampling. We no longer have this bottleneck architectures like UNET, like RDK images where you first down sample and so on. Um, and we also have no max pooling because then we lose too much um, detailed information. And on the other hand, we also, we don't need it usually because we don't have to account for this um, basic, this big scale um, difference in, in objects, uh, like we, we have to do when we see a car in a computer vision image. It can be small and it's far away, it can be very big when it's close to the camera, but we don't have to do this here because the satellite always flies at the same altitude. So we basically, again, uh, designed this um, architecture, uh, CNN, and input is a central two image, and output then is the estimated canopy height. So we redirectly regress the height using a very um, rather simple Euclidean loss function for regressing continuous height values. 
and we have um, a two penalty term here on the model parameters, which is as a regularizer, which is called in, in deep net terms is called rate rate decay. And then you have the number of pixels here is n. You have the vegetation high predictions here, and you have the ground truth here. And um, then you have the model parameters here and the number here. And we do experiments um, where we have reference data. And at the time when we published this work, we didn't have so much. So we had the reference data for whole Switzerland. So we have two regions of interest in Switzerland. And we got uh, five different um, reference data areas from full wave from airborne LIDAR data from our NASA colleagues in Gabon, which is a country in, in West Africa, which has a lot of very dense na native rainforest with very high trees, so up to 65 meters. And when we apply our model, we this uh, we plot the ground truth versus the prediction, and if everything is perfect, everything should be on the diagonal. And of course, it's not completely perfect, um, but we see that uh, the results are rather nice. We get the mean absolute error for Gabon of 4.3 meters, and in Switzerland for below 2 meters, but also, of course, the trees in Switzerland are smaller, so up to 35 meters, where in Gabon they are much larger. Up uh, to 1665 meters. And if we plot the error here, so the Gabon um, is in green and Switzerland is in blue. Um, so in Switzerland only goes up to this interval. And we plot this error per interval. We see that uh, the error for Switzerland is increasing with canopy height. And usually this is also the case, and especially for the very late, late, um, very high trees. We see that. After 40, 50 meters, our method saturates. Uh, so if we look at trees above 60 meters, and they also we have almost no training data because they are very rare, uh, we get very high errors. And we also found then, by the way, that we had uh, gross errors in the Swiss ground truth. So the Swiss ground truth is based for vegetation height is based on um, subtracting a digital elevation model from a digital surface model, which are both uh, the digital service model is um, acquired uh, through multi-view stereo matching from airborne um, imaging campaigns. And we saw what we found is that there are very big errors, especially at steep slopes, which is due to a mismatch of uh, the, the DEM and the DSM. So actually our method is a bit better than, than what is shown here. So some results visualized. So, uh, this is a NASA map of Carbon from the paper last in 2011. And color encodes um, vegetation height. And this is our uh, map. So NASA has a spatial resolution of one kilometer. We have a spatial resolution of 10 meters, so much, much better. And then in this white box, this is a, um, a high resolution visualization now. Um, and we can see that in our method here, especially in this delta where we have a lot of mangroves, very high mangroves up to 60 meters, we are all we get all the fine grained details very well. While well, this NASA model um, basically misses all of that. And in Switzerland, again, the existing NASA model then has a strong bias because it's a very mountainous terrain to overestimating. So here in Engadin, for example, um, it's basically assigning. 40 meter high trees in NASA model to in very high alpine regions, which which is completely wrong. And then we see our model here at the same place is much more accurate. So it gets most of the vegetation heights uh, really nicely. Yes, and then now uh, we are working on uh, scaling this globally because you can imagine um, for deep nets, you always need the ground truth and reference data to train your models. And that was a big issue. And we thought, OK, how can we get around this uh, thing? And um, then um, we got to know this uh, NASA JEDI campaign, which is a campaign of, of NASA, where they put a full wave for laser scanner on the International Space Station. And it's a full waveform thing and meant for vegetation height, so canopy height mapping and biomass estimation. And uh, this is just a video from NASA JEDI of the mission. So this is the ISS that you, you can see. And the instrument is here. So this is the module to have payload on the ISS. And this is the payload here is the laser. It has um, those laser, laser beams that shoot all the way down here. And um, eight different laser beams with a certain distance. And um, there's a gap in between. 
and it scans then um, along track these tracks. And each pulse is like sent out here, since it's a full waveform, gets usually more than a thousand returns. And so this is the, the, the ground um, here, and this is the canopy height, and this is to the and this is the height plotted here on the y-axis, and on the right axis, on the x-axis, it's plotted the intensity uh, with what this um, the reflections come back. And you see that there's a lot of energy coming back, of course, from the top canopy. Uh, so this is the first peak. And then it's getting less and less, but you can still see it follows the vegetation structure down to the bottom. And then there's quite a peak um, uh, at the ground um, again. And what we now want to measure with our model is basically the difference between this peak and this peak to get the vegetation height. Okay, so, and it turns out that, um, of course, the, um, if we want to, so first thing, what we wanted to do, we just wanted to take the product that NASA, the NASA JEDA team is producing, so they have a product on vegetation height directly. But we compared it to our reference data in Switzerland, Gabon, turned out that it was just very inaccurate. So what we then is that we reached out to our NASA colleagues, Ralph Dubaya and John Armstrong, and we said, look, uh, what if we try to recalibrate um, your JEDI data and with a machine learning approach, which is what they didn't do. So they don't use machine learning. They have a mecha mechanistic approach to model this, which is then different for different places on Earth. And we wanted one uh, single um, deep net approach for um, the entire globe, for the entire Earth, for all the data, no matter if it's in Africa, North America, Europe, Australia, South America. And at the same time, it's very important, especially in the environmental sciences, but for many other fields also, outside computer vision, to assign a probability or an uncertainty to the output values. And if you are a bit familiar with the CNNs or deep learning in general, you know that deep learning per se is not a probabilistic approach as opposed to a maximum likelihood or random forests and so on. So what we do is so-called Bayesian deep learning, which is a new and exciting field that um, we should look much further into. It's we have, which combines the power of the, the prediction accuracy of deep learning with the interpretability and the uncertainty estimation of uh, well, well uh, calibrated uncertainties of probabilistic approaches. So what you then basically do is you get this raw waveform as input and we train an ensemble of CNNs. So we have 10 different CNNs all are trained separately on the same data, but with random initializations. And we have two outputs per model to approximate the conditional probability. So the mean value and the variance. And then we minimize the Gaussian negative log likelihood. And we optimize over the CNN parameters with the stochastic gradient. So this is a loss function per CNN. And um, then if you do this, um, you can combine the outputs of all this. So this is the output per model. So, and um, you can, for canopy height, then you get all the different output outputs per model. So this blue, for example, from here, this one from here, this one from here. And you basically try to approximate the Gaussian through these different outputs. And this is what is shown here. And it's what you then do um, is um, this comes from Alex Kendall's paper from 2017, his Oxford group, is this that you model two different parts of the uncertainty. So one is called the epistemic uncertainty, which is the model uncertainty, and the other one is the aleatory data uncertainty. And you come up um, basically with one final output, a prediction, and an uncertainty estimation. So if you do this, and now this is very new, this is all new, it's unpublished material, so this is then, if you do this, uh, train the model on the reference site that our NASA colleagues gave us and you validate it, and then you apply it to the whole Earth, and this is what you get. So this is the canopy height um, in, of, of the whole globe. So let's say, uh, except in Northern Canada and a bit of Northern Europe and, and your, uh, Russia, Northern Mongolia and so on, because the ISS only flies up to, to here. So if you then plot the canopy height at 0.5 degree resolution, this is what you get. You see a lot of very high trees here in, in Brazil and the Amazon area, here in the tropical regions of Africa and Gabon. Gabon is here and in Congo here, and also in Indonesia, Malaysia, and so on. 
And also very north here, there's all those redwood trees um, around in the state of Washington, around Seattle. And another interesting thing is we can then also for each prediction assign the predictive standard deviation. And when we plot this, we can see the standard deviation is between zero and six meters. Everything above six meters is also clipped here. Um, then you get this map and you see that the standard deviation basically increases with the height of the tree. So in the very high tree areas, you get also higher standard deviations. In other areas, it's much lower. All right, so this is the end of my presentation. Um, I hope I could uh, show you um, quite uh, uh, some interesting projects. And I want also to say that, of course, most of the work um, is not done by myself. So this is my team. In the meantime, there is, it's, even, it's bigger even. But it's all thanks to them that this uh, cool stuff uh, can be researched and worked on. For example, Nico here, he's working on that vegetation height mapping project that I just showed. While, uh, while uh, Andres is working on the oil pump density and so on. So this is a fantastic team and things go to them. Um, some exciting or two exciting future directions that we are currently working with is that we try to combine deep learning with physics-based modeling to get rid of a lot of training data and make our models more interpretable and uh, graph CNNs, more research on that. So ge ge geometric deep learning also use it for remote sensing on more environmental sciences approaches. All right, so thanks a lot for, for listening and um, I'm looking forward to your questions. So thank you, Jan, for the nice presentation and exciting results, actually. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> before going to the, to the questions, I'd like just to, to <clears throat> give some, some comments here. Um, actually, in, I don't know, the, the last month, I guess, I was wondering. Um, I have seen some some some, some works. Uh, they apply their concern about you know shell networks and mainly on low low resolution images. And I think that the number of works are you know like they're increasing because you know. Uh, most of the time, we don't have a lot of data. Uh, we don't have computational resources. Like, you know, sometimes the winner is just the guy that has data, right? Uh, yes. or, data or, you know, more computational resources. And if you know that companies like Facebook and, and, and Google, they have that kind of thing, right? Uh, for you, I mean, and, and also, it seems that, you know, that, that kind of companies, they are more concerned about, you know, problems related to, you know, biometrics, face recognition, um, and computer vision stuff, right? Um, do you think that uh, we have, do we have many industries working on uh, remote sensing thing? I mean, and also the, the other question is, should we consider to work on, you know, like, shallow network, thinking about uh, new architectures that can be embedded on board systems and, and this kind of thing. What do you think about it? Yes, so I, I absolutely agree with you. So the first point is that a lot of the, let's say, top CVPR papers, or ICLR and so on, and those papers, they need um, a lot of computational power that in academia, we often, we don't have it or then we really need to bet on this one single project to, to get all the numbers right. Um, I must say um, that we, of course, at ETH, we are lucky we have a supercomputing cluster and so on, so we can still do it. But as a personal point of view, I must say as soon as it's only about squeezing the last, uh, I don't know, 0.2 percentage point out of a method, and you use, I don't know how many GPU hours and years for that, I'm, as an academic, I'm no longer interested. I think this is incremental. It, it's not interesting. It's not. It's not a new invention. It's not the method by itself. Um, I can. I can happily leave it to to Google and Facebook. Yeah. So um, it's not. It is even not that I don't want to compete. I think it's it's incremental research. Yeah, mm -hmm. we are scientists in academia, and I, I can understand the company companies. I mean, they need to make a product work. They need to squeeze the last bits of accuracy out of it. But we in academia, I mean, we are there to do uh, uh, moonshots, right? 
So yeah, yeah. we have to come up with new and bright ideas. Uh, I don't want to, we don't need to or should waste our creativity, time and energy um, on, on tuning those numbers, increasing that. So I think it's better to look into really new directions, new algorithms, like, I don't know, marrying physics with deep nets or graph geometric deep learning and so on. And um, yes, so that's my view on that. Then the second point is uh, remote sensing. I see now more and more that there are very capable remote sensing people with a strong machine learning uh, background that really do cool research in machine learning um, on uh, with using remote sensing data as, as a data set. And I think it's a bit a uh, natural development that the first breakthroughs were on computer vision images because they are just much more available. They are also easier to annotate. Yeah. If you have something like Amazon Mechanical Turk, you download, I don't know, tens of thousands of vision images from the web. That's very quick. And you give it to Mechanical Turkers to annotate. That's also very quick. Then it's a much quicker process. In remote sensing for a long time, we didn't have the situation. I mean, we didn't have this uh, data for free. Now it's coming more and more. And we also didn't have this um, massive amount of sensors up in space, which is also changing now, right? And then also for a long time, only few people from our community had access to a lot of data because it was very expensive to acquire. Uh, so, but this is rapidly changing now. And I see that this is moving more and more into a direction where also we, as people with a remote sensing background or uh, the other way around, people with a computer science background, uh, get interested and, and can marry this to communities. I mean, I've been organizing this Earth Vision workshop now for the last years and from the first edition on together with Davis Tuya and other friends and colleagues. And I see that this has more and more impact. And also because I see that a lot of people from the vision community are tired on working only vision images because a lot of the big companies are taking all the, all the let's say, prizes and awards. Um, for them, it also gets interesting to look more into remote sensing data because it's something that is a bit less explored. There's still a lot more challenges. I mean, for example, data annotation, how to label things. If you move away from the standard objects that are in OpenStreetMap, it gets very hard. For example, in my case, biomass. You cannot bio annotate biomass based on an image. Uh, so yeah, yeah. you need to be there. You need to do something about it. And exactly that, uh, so collecting reference data becomes more and more of an issue there. So, and this now comes to your um, third point is, um, I agree, like looking into new ways, more shallow networks, uh, cool physics constraints, looking all to into, um, I don't know, physics simulations like DART or something for uh, ray tracers uh, for this kind of stuff and, and marrying a forward simulation of remote sensing images with the deep nets and so on. I think that's cool stuff. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's a lot of things uh, that we can do from our remote sensing perspective, where I would hope that we are also, at least now, still a bit ahead of the whole machine learning vision crowd. So, yeah. yes, yeah, so I, I, I hope I answered most of your thoughts. Yeah, no, I just like to start this kind of conversation and then, then, you know, like shed light these to our young students and, you know, just to, to enlighten them with these kind of questions. And you know that most of, you know, we have a lot of works, they are data set oriented and we must uh, give our attention to the research as well, not get all, only focus on, on accuracy, you know, this kind of thing, uh, just like this kind of provocation, but yes. Uh, and then, um, so let's get started with the, the, the questions and also like to introduce you, Professor uh, José Quintanilla. Uh, he's our invited researcher from the University of Sao Paulo. And also um, Matheus Barros, he is also our invited student from the University of Minas Gerais, right? So uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the session as well. Um, so I think we have a, a couple of questions here, right? Uh, Thank, okay, thank, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I enjoy very much the presentation, a very didactic presentation, uh, clear. I enjoy it very much. And uh, I would like to be grateful to the Jefferson and the coordinators of the event for this opportunity. 
Uh, in fact, uh, after see your presentation, uh, many questions uh, could be formulated, but uh, I will focus in a, in, in a special case. Uh, today, in a, we, we call small objects, mainly in urban features, né? like a landscape, underlying scarf, uh, objects on top of the roof, uh, urban flooding, traffic sign, etc. Uh, how deep learning or machine learning né, can help uh, the analysts? In this case, I think the probabilistic approach could be better than the deep learning, deep learning approach. Yes, I, I, I agree that for a lot of uh, real-world applications and a lot of uh, research outside the vision community, the probabilities or uncertainty estimation that uh, is the that comes with the predictions that we make is absolutely essential. Yeah. I, I, would, I, I would never go to the Red Cross and say, look, this is my water depth estimation or my map of uh, the water flooding from a deep net, um, but I, don't, I cannot tell you how much can you trust it. Right? So okay. it's, it's, I'm, I, frankly speaking, I think then it's useless for them because it's, it's putting lives in danger and also, they need to be very um, uh, sure about everything that we give them. And um, I agree that uh, if you have not much training or something, just starting with established methods, probabilistic methods like random forest, for example, that's an absolute good, perfect approach. Right? Um, but I, I wanted to make the point here also in the last part, and we are going more and more to this direction, that there are new ways of marrying or integrating both worlds. So you can, uh, in the case now we did this for the Jedi sensor, have um, a deep learning engine and still have very well calibrated uncertainties. Yeah, because it's, it's, although it's not a probabilistic method per se, it's about calibrating the output scores of a CNN. So and they are usually, usually the output scores of the deep nets or CNNs they are either overconfident or underconfident. Something in between is not happening. Yeah. And, and, and one way is uh, the way that uh, um, there are multiple different ways, but this ensemble approach with a, um, this uh, particular um, loss where we estimate the mean and the variance, and then you combine it using aleatoric and epistemic uncertainties. And those um, uncertainty estimates are very well calibrated. And there are several methods to test and to verify it, because we don't have ground truth for probability values or, uh, for obvious reasons mm -hmm. and for remote sensing. But uh, there are several ways where you can actually um, verify that it, they are very close to the true uncertainty estimates. And we also saw this in our uh, JEDI predictions now, because um, in our training data, for example, we have only trees up to 70 meters high. Uh, but in the real world, we have much higher trees, above 100 meters, and our model can predict those trees, so it sort of has to extrapolate, right? Although those trees are, has never seen such high trees in the training data. And we see, for example, that, um, that the uncertainty is very high for those high estimates. Although we see when we um, look at them up that it's rather, rather accurate. But there's a lot of, so we can see that it, this combination of deep learning and uncertainty estimation um, is very promising and I think is an exciting um, field to, to explore. On the downside at the moment is what we do is, I mean, we have to train 10 different CNNs, yeah? So it's uh, computationally super expensive and this is of course a bottleneck. Yeah? So we need to get rid of, of that, that's a problem. And, and I think it would be exciting if we as people with a, let's say not only a vision background, but remote sensing and that we are used to working with uncertainties, we should invest more time and energy into creating novelty there and to marrying our world of probability theory, uncertainty estimation and so on with deep nets. I think that's, that's very promising. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I make my more, one more question? Mateus. 
Well, I'd like to thank the, the team first for the invitation and thank Professor Yan for the presentation. It was great. Many interesting topics and applications. I have some questions here, but I see that the everyone that is watching us, they also have some questions. So maybe we should give them some attention. Um, here we have a question from John Davey Perez Arguello. How to face the difficulty of detecting objects with CNN in high resolution images like 2000 per 2000 pixels or more? Yes, so what we do is, so the first thing is you can basically tile your image and, and then stitch the tiles back together after you have processed them. So you basically have a certain stride um, when you move across the image and you basically put, you, you, you tile the image basically and put those tiles back together. That's sort of, uh, I would say, a good engineering that is also built into yeah, PyTorch libraries or TensorFlow. So if you look for remote sensing, also other, other works, um, we have implemented this here, for example. Um, of course, if you are looking for something where you have a receptive field, right, of 2000 by 2000 pixels, um, I mean, they, uh, you need, so you really want to learn all of that. You need um, to look for some um, yeah, non-standard CNNs. For example, one thing is um, use um, some form of, of, of graph CNNs. So you no longer on a, operate on a, on a pixel level, but you look for key points or, or something like this. Um, and then there are other variants um, that completely go into novel research. Some, some ideas from the top of my head now is that you do some sort of multi-scale approach. Yeah, you go for lower resolution first, and then you have separate streams, like with sort of an arc tree representation um, for, look for more high scale features and mappings um, when you get more fine, fine, fine grained evidence. But I think that's an, if you really want to have a single, let's say, operator, a CNN that has a receptive field of 2000 by 2000 pixels, at the moment, if you have a dense image, you cannot process it. At least we cannot. So, yeah, graph CNNs, some hierarchical approach, I would say. So that's good. Uh, so I have one question here from Luis. Uh, so do you think the connect sensor can be used in the super resolution project for for detecting indoors uh, cloud of view instead of lighter? Uh, well, and then I got another question, but you, you can go with this one. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure I understand this cloud of view. But so in general, I mean, that's what we did, right? So we, we used the Kinect sensor indoors, and that's the result I, I showed. And other data sets and so also do this. So in general, if I understand the question correctly, it's about if we can basically replace LiDAR um, very accurate measurements with a standard Kinect with a lot of noise indoors. And in general, um, I think, yes. So for a lot of applications, if you do not want very accurate measurements, and you could just use a Kinect nowadays or newer versions of depth sensors and use the super resolution approach, absolutely. Um, I mean, um, also this is some stuff that is built into some smartphones already now, like uh, Huawei or, or Apple and so on. So you can abso absolutely do that. Of course, if you want to measure so, uh, super accurately also distances and so on for some reason, um, then I would still use a LiDAR sensor. Uh, but for standard visualization or interior architecture or whatever, or getting a rough estimate of the layout of the room and stuff, um, that's completely sufficient with the Kinect and, and the super resolution approach. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, and actually, I was wondering when you, when you presented uh, your work related to super resolution, right? And then you have a, um, that's a cool thing. From a low resolution image, you have an, an, another high resolution image from a different domain, and then you can do the super resolution thing. Uh, and then you mentioned something about some artifacts in order related to the texture of the guide image, right? So have you analyzed the influence of the guide image, or can can we how, how is the proper way to choose a guide image, or can we use a set of guide images to have some sort of, I don't know, an average image, you know, this kind of thing? So, I mean, in, in, in general, um, yeah, it's hard to, to say. I mean, if you, the larger the training data set is, 
that has multiple guide images in them with any kind of texture, the, the, the better the model gets and the less texture will get, get transferred. So then in general, of course, there are a lot of cases where you can just not uh, get rid of it. I think in general, um, for this approach to get rid of the, the texture, of course, the best thing is use an image without texture. Yeah, so with just plain surfaces, like you see behind me on the wall next to the poster. Yeah? Um, but then, of course, sometimes you would also get in trouble with the depth image for those places, but because uh, then depth uh, images might also not be so good, but yeah. And um, so, yeah, I think it just needs uh, improvements to the method, honestly, because the, the way we do it now that we directly predict from one pixel or like a neighborhood also the depth is just prone to artifacts by texture. So you need to explicitly probably build this in through the loss functions to disregard any RGB texture. You need to, to learn that um, and, and these things. So my first thing would be to put it into the loss function. Then you might also think about some, I don't know, deep supervisions or some intermediate losses that really try to um, distinguish between um, the object, surface, and, and texture already in the RGB image. So you really try to discard in the network at an intermediate stage the texture and try to distinguish from the rest of the, the evidence. But this is just some ideas. Yeah, we haven't done it, but you can do it. Yeah, yeah uh, and also maybe we said something, but your your guide image was like it real or synthetic one? It's real. So yeah. the, the guide, so it's a real data set. Right. Um, I, to go back to the paper, but it's um, like the NYU data set, it's benchmark data sets All right. of the computer vision community. But we also, it didn't show it, we have it in this um, this ICCV paper also, we have a completely second data set in remote sensing. So mm -hmm. there we did uh, basically super resolution for vegetation height mapping on based on satellite right. imaging. Yeah. So there it also works, but we see the same thing that also some texture, let's say some stuff that is not some some roads and then fields next to it, they also transfer a bit to the super resolution depth image then, although they have the same height or depth in, in this in, in real world. All right. That, right. Yes, yeah, so so um let me see here. Uh, Jose, Jose, you, you, you sent us some some nice questions by email, right? Do you wanna try yes, some? Yes. <laughs> I would like to, to to make another one. Uh, in the, your editorial on the special issue of the International Journal of Geoinformatics, you mentioned he, there is a need to share data in source code publicly. Right? How this issue is being addressed by the international community? particularly in the case of the crowdsourced data. Uh, there are some guidelines to, have, to avoid the legal problems. I don't know. Yes, I agree. I think we push, should really push in our community for open sourcing um, data and source code. Yeah. And we try to make this possible whenever we can, uh, especially in remote sensing, and for a long time, from my point of view, it was a good tradition that each group had his, its own collection of satellite images, would not share it, and then publish a lot of papers with that paper. No one could ever check or prove whether the improvement publishing the papers is due to just them being having access to the data set or if it's due to the method. So I think it needs a lot of effort in benchmark data sets. And we, we made some effort also the IEEE, GRSS, Data Fusion content. So I think this is on SpaceNet also very valuable uh, benchmarks. Also we had ISPS benchmark sets, very valuable. But also us, when we publish papers, we should make our data available. Although this is sometimes hard because it's massive amounts of data. So um, for example, what we do, we cannot put everything on the server, but the, the source code, when we are allowed to and not bound by any constraint by any partners, yeah, um, then we put the source code online. If we haven't done so for some papers, um, then we're still cleaning it up. Or if it's not available on website, I, everyone out there also listening today, email us and we will share it with you. Yeah. So this is what we do. Um, 
I see a point though, like massive amounts of let's say 702 images, for example, if we want to share those, we can no longer upload upload several terabytes of data while the web and shared, let's say, with our colleagues in Brazil. I mean, it's almost impossible. And then it's keeping collecting data data all the time. So this is why SpaceNet and also other challenges are moving to the cloud, like the Amazon cloud or other clouds. Yeah. And we need to think of new ways how to do that without having without people having to to pay for access because then it's a paywall again and only privileged people can access the data and, and so on. So I think I would see as a community, we need something like a community cloud or something that is running, I don't know, at ETH University or in, in Sao Paulo or in Minas Gerais. And where we as a community, we maintain, we pay for it, and then everyone gets access and all the data is there. So no one has to download. So just as an idea. Yeah. So then in Switzerland, just on a side note, there's a strong push for um, open access. So for example, um, when I, I can say so, I believe this uh, typical uh, publishing houses, yeah, Springer, Elsevier and so on, they make a, a lot of money uh, with doing very little work from my point of view. With scientists, we do the most. And in Switzerland, we now negotiated that any Springer and Elsevier publications, all of them are open access. Yeah. So, and we don't, and the Swiss institutions don't have to pay extra for that. It's all open access now. And I think that's very important too, that everyone, although of course now it becomes less an issue because at least in computer science, most publications are an archive anyway. Mm -hmm. But uh, still I think open access <sighs> publications and open access to data and source code is absolutely essential for progress. And also such that everyone on the globe, does, no matter where people, are working where they are based, if they are in Ghana or in Switzerland or in Brazil, they can do really cool research. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I think uh, in the same way. I hope we, in the f near future we have uh, more shared data, algorithms, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Uh, Matheus? It yes, seems you, are, you are quite uh, excited to, to, to ask something, right? Yes, I have a question about multimodal data and, and also crowdsourcing. Uh, in your opinion, what are the main challenges of working with crowdsourced data and in union with remote sensing that sometimes provide completely different types of data? So, I mean, so we work with crowdsourced data that is app sourced, right? So it's some app, some people that collect images we have, for, for example, a project going on for biodiversity mapping that I didn't talk about today with the iNaturalist app, and we have another app in Switzerland. The problem is that there are strong biases in crowdsource data due to several underlying effects and causes. For example, for if, you, if we task people to take images of plant and animal species, one thing is that people uh, try, they, they like the beautiful things, right? So we get a lot of uh, flower images, but nothing from insects. Right? <laughs> Although insects are just as important or more important. So we get a very long tail distributions for the classes, a lot of training data for very few classes and the very few training data for the most thing. So that's one. Then another bias is uh, a, a geospatial sampling is just uh, based on how can I access something. So in Switzerland, if you go to the very high alpine regions, there's not much. People cannot go into the snow up to 4,000 meters, at least not many, and uh, collect data. And then, of course, it's biased towards urban um, uh, places. So we have a data set of friends uh, from a crowdsourced app, PlantNet, and the, the place with the biggest biodiversity in most samples is Paris, the city of Paris. Yeah. So it's just because people have the app, they go outside into some park and they take a photo, that's it. It's just where most of the people live. Yeah. So that's another bias. So I think, um, yeah, and then it's a, it's a matter how to correct the bias. So we are currently working on a project where we have this big crowdsource data set, biodiversity in, in Switzerland, which is very biased with many biases. And we have a much smaller data set, which, which is unbiased, which was biodiversity sampled 
from our colleagues from environmental sciences, where they have a regular grid for Switzerland and they revisit every couple of years. So now the idea is to sort of get rid of the bias of the big data set using the small data set while still leveraging on this huge amount of data that comes from the big data set. But it's ongoing research. Yeah. But it's a, it's a very relevant question. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, thank you, Matteo. So we have one more question from the audience. Uh, from Anderson is saying that in his doctoral research, he's seeking for tracks the life of sustainability, right? Universities uh, using artificial intelligence. And yeah, do you recommend any specific approach to measure sustainability? Have you worked on that? So I think my first, I would first ask a question back, what do we understand in the sustainability? Because sustainability, same as artificial intelligence, is such a buzzy umbrella term, very fuzzy, and that everyone is using, and that has bit, lost a bit of its meaning from my point of view. But I don't want to, I think it's a very relevant question. I think if you, let's say, the first thing is specify what do you want to measure? What do you want to measure biomass? Do you want to measure canopy cover, the amount of greenness, for example, yeah. vegetation cover. Do you want to measure emissions, CO2 emissions, for example, something like this. And if, if, if you go for something like this, so you say, for example, well, I want to measure how much vegetation, how, how much vegetation is in my city. First thing is the semantic segmentation, right? So you, you estimate, okay, what's, how much vegetation, how, what is in my city? If you want to go for biomass, um, then you need to factor in um, the, the height of the trees and, and so on, right? Then you need some LiDAR data or now JEDI data, for example. You need to factor that in. Um, if you want to be very bold and, and work with your colleagues from climate research, then um, ask them for their models. Yeah? So how do they predict uh, an air flow through the city based on a digital surface model and together with rainfall and combine um, the outputs of your semantic segmentation with their model. And you might even want to use some of the input data also as input for your model or as an additional constraint. And then it goes to physics consistent or physics constraint deep nets, right? So if you want to say, I really want to know, let's say, a sustain, have a sustainability index for my city and you have as input my the models from my colleagues from climate research, I have a semantic segmentation, a land use cover and so on. Uh, then you can have a model and try to learn it and have several constraints, right? So I have, a, I don't know, some maximum index and I have a constraint on maximum air exchange and flow and emission, CO2 emissions for a particular city and so on. There would be right. my answer. So no, no solution, yeah. but some ideas. <laughs> yeah, it's a broad uh, question, right? Uh, so maybe, maybe we have what? One last question, maybe, I don't know, uh, José or, or Mateus, do you have any, any more questions? Well, I have one, if, it's, if it, we have enough time, I have one, at yeah. least one. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I, I, I made a quick search about the use application huh, of deep learning, machine learning in general, using the spectral libraries like uh, NASA, Landsat, uh, USGS. Uh, there is a, a few publications uh, using this. Is there is any, any reason for that? Uh, is a, a research area to be explored in the near future? So I, I see a lot of potential in that direction to combine what we did already in the past and what we understand well as spectral libraries, also hyperspectral imagery and so on. So really knowing about spectral signatures of particular, I don't know, cocoa plants, for example, or, or something, or soy or something, marrying this physics knowledge with deep nets and or using the spectral libraries really, let's say, as a lookup table and having just a deep net that takes out the that spectral signature that fits best to what you see in a, in a remote sensing image and so on. So some, and I see this is a big image topic because uh, it, your uh, predictions in deep nets, if you marry it with a spectral library, for example, 
um, really get the physics constraint, they get much more meaningful because it's not just some deep net black box prediction. It has really a meaning and you can tie it to, a phys to the physics. Uh, a second thing is, my hope would be you need a lot less training data because um, you know a lot about the spectral properties of a lot of materials and plants and so on already. So we might get rid of this nasty task of having to label vast amounts of uh, areas uh, in aerial images or satellite images manually as training data. Uh, so my hope would also be that we can get rid of this effort. We can have, let's say, models with the same predictive power, but a lot of less less training data. So we could frame it as a weekly supervised task or something like this. Yeah. And then another, a, a third point is, I think we, we will see a re-advent of a generative model. So the GANs yeah, is, is a deep net approach. At the moment, everything is discriminative. When I started my PhD, a lot of things were generative, maximum likelihood and so on. Then everything, conditional random field also was discriminative. We say, okay, discriminative, this is great. And now deep nets are also discriminative. But I see, I think there's true value looking now into generative models back again, because they have a richer modeling representation of the joint distributions. And I think there's a lot of potential there. And also with respect to spectral libraries, simulations of, of uh, the spectral properties, radiometric calibration and so on. So, Yes, I, I absolutely agree. I think that's a fantastic uh, direction of research. Okay, thank so, you very much. Nice touch, Jan. Uh, so I think we're unfortunately coming to, to the end. Uh, it was like, I think it is an exciting topic of research. Um, and I also like to, to thank the audience, the moderators, Jose, Mateus, the organizers. Uh, Jefferson, Veraldo, uh, and also on Phil and Dunk, yeah, for your, your yeah. presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was very nice indeed with very uh, state-of-the-art results. Very exciting. So once again, thank you all and have a great day and hopefully in good health for everyone. Right? Thank Thanks you guys. Thanks a lot, everyone. Take care. Take, Take care. care. Bye. Bye.